Okay, we're live now. So we wait one more minute and then we kick off. Okay, it's three o'clock, so I think we can start. So, um, dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this third uh, session of the MEP Water Group already again in the last few months, this time on uh, energy neutrality. Uh, my name is Dirk Kroll. I'm the executive director of Water Europe, the management body of, um, of the MEP Water Group. I'm pleased to share with you that we today have 184 registered participants through, uh, through Zoom, and we're also broadcasting through LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. So with a brief introduction, I'd like to pass the floor to Pania Weiss, uh, the, the chair of the MEP Water Group. Pania? Thank you so much, Dirk, and uh, thank you to uh, you and your staff for establishing this very important afternoon. Again, every drop counts uh, when it comes to speak up the importance of uh, the water in our climate transition and as well also in the environmental issues uh, of the Union. Um, I'm very, very happy uh, that uh, we can announce that we have with us uh, uh, from the beginning a uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Ketri Simpson, it is very, very uh, appreciated that you can share with us a little of your very valuable time uh, to help us also to unfold what is on the agenda this afternoon, namely uh, the so-called water uh, energy nexus. Because we know uh, th those of us who work with uh, energy efficiency and the water agenda that there is a huge potential uh, for the green transition from integrating uh, and also uh, cross-sectorial, uh, the links between uh, uh, water and the life circle of, of the, the water ecology uh, ecosystem uh, with the uh, energy uh, st uh, strategy of the union. Uh, so we very, very much appreciate uh, your time uh, with us, uh, dear uh, Ketri Simpson. And also, I would like, on behalf of my dear colleagues from the European Parliament, who is a part of the Met Water Group, um, Ulrike Müller from, uh, from uh, Renew, uh, um, Alexis um, Vondra from ECR, and uh, uh, also a very special warm welcome to uh, Bernd Lange from uh, uh, SD, who is one of the founding fathers of the uh, Water Framework Directives uh, set in uh, pluralism. So we are a strong group of listeners and also uh, of the debaters uh, for the uh, uh, whole um, uh, afternoon after we have said goodbye to you, uh, Kathy Simpson, we will uh, continue our talks with the three very, very important keynote speakers. Uh, uh, Jonas uh, Villersen from uh, Grundfos uh, in Denmark and uh, Professor Ewan McAdam from Canfield University and Alexis de Kerhove, I hope I said that uh, the right way, from uh, Siglim. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we have heard uh, your speech, Kathleen Simpson, and the three keynotes uh, as well. We will have Q and A's, and I very much urge uh, the audience, although you are many people, to address your uh, questions in the chat function, uh, but also to rely on our um, obligation to follow up on your questions after this event in uh, the social media uh, um, uh, posts that will be sent out uh, uh, from this event. Enough said as an introduction. I hope you will all have a, a great one and a half hour together with us. And I give the floor to you, Kathy Simpson. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pernilla, and, uh, and good afternoon from Brussels. Well, um, 
I, I sincerely like uh, uh, like to th thank uh, the MEP Photo Group for the invitation and uh, for continuing uh, the important portal policy discussion uh, from the particular <coughs> perspective of Porter and uh, IT Nexus. Um, I'm very much convinced that the European Green Deal, uh, with its, uh, with its uh, holistic approach, is uh, the right framework to address and improve the water energy nexus. Uh, the European Green Deal is our new growth strategy um, to transform the EU into a fair and inclusive and prosperous society. And we do it um, through a modern, knowledge-driven, competitive, but also resource-efficient economy and uh, the sustainable development goals, which highlight um, the importance of uh, water and energy efficiency are an uh, intrinsic part of the European Green Deal. And water is used uh, throughout the energy industry and uh, the water system needs energy for um, collecting, pumping, treating and um, desalinating water and increasing water and energy needs or changes in, energy, in water availability um, due to climate change could have significant effects on, on the energy system. Thus, it is um, critical and crucial to establish well-targeted and um, concerted actions that um, effectively address uh, the use and management of energy and water resources sim simultaneously. And the Commission fully understands the importance of this um, water energy nexus. Uh, with a Fit for 55 package, we will uh, issue a recommendation and guidelines on the practical application of the energy efficiency first principle. And the energy sector and the water sector alike uh, stand to benefit from this principle. This applies across industrial, residential and um, agricultural water cycles. Applying uh, the energy efficiency first principle in this way uh, means exploring solutions um, that uh, break the link between energy consumption and water consumption. Solutions um, to reduce energy demand in the water sector should apply to all types of projects at all stages along the whole uh, water treatment and supply chain. And the energy efficiency first principle should equally apply when uh, setting long-term budgets at regional and local level. The energy efficiency directive is actually uh, sector neutral. Nevertheless, um, the upcoming revision of this directive will further encourage energy savings in the water sector and cost-effective energy savings potential will be um, unlocked by more ambitious energy efficiency targets and uh, strengthen measures in line with the assessment in the climate target plan. The climate target plan underlines um, the need to increase um, current energy efficiency targets to 36 uh, to 37% for final and 39 to 41% for primary energy consumption in order to achieve the 55% climate target for 2030. And the revision of the um, directive would encourage further energy savings in various sectors, also in the public sector. And more energy efficient water treatment uh, processes would relieve municipalities' budgets, especially when municipalities own the water utility, um, the electricity consumption of water and wastewater plants might represent a significant share of their energy bills. And regional or, or na national uh, measures applied by implementing the energy savings uh, obligation and also trigger further investment in uh, water efficiency. The last element of our energy efficiency policies um, I want to mention is um, the upcoming sustainable product policy initiative announced in the circular economy action plan. And water consumption is an important efficiency and environmental footprint. Um, for many household uh, appliances. And we are currently working on revising the Eco Design Directive and related proposals, altogether um, reviewing our legislation under the current mandate will also help strengthen the links uh, with uh, other policies. Here I have in mind water and wastewater related legislation like the Drinking Water Directive, um, the Urban uh, Wastewater Treatment Directive and the um, Industrial Emissions Directive. 
uh, while energy efficiency is at the core of our discussions uh, today, uh, I would uh, still like to underline that the energy water nexus is also something very much aligned with our renewable energy policy. I want to mention three points here. First, uh, the Fit for 55 package commits um, to a strong increase in the share of renewable energy. Uh, the climate target plan confirms that to meet our 55 target, we should increase the share of renewables by 38 to 40% by 2030, which is um, twice the 2020 target and uh, substantially higher than the existing 32% we had previously envisaged. Uh, this is good news, not only for the climate, but also for water use. We expect uh, the biggest growth in electricity production to come from solar PV and wind. Both technologies are over the life cycle and um, including uh, raw material extraction and manufacturing among the technologies um, with the lowest water footprint. And um, the International Energy Agency recently announced that in 2020, we saw a 45% rise of annual new renewable capacity to almost 280 uh, gigawatts. And this is the highest year on uh, um, yearly increase since 1999. And wind and solar are indeed breaking uh, record after record. And second, hydropower plays an important um, role in the electric system. Um, uh, electricity system too, in 2019, it produced 35% um, of uh, all renewable electricity in the EU. And due to their flexibility and their large uh, storage capacity, hydropower plants of all sizes are among the key technologies to back up variable uh, renewables such as wind and solar power. And here we need strategically design more integrated hydropower plant, uh, hydropower uh, plans and projects that uh, take into account water bodies ecological requirements so early on in the, in the, in the planning process. And third, uh, there is a sleeping giant in renewable energy production, um, wastewater treatment plants. Today, uh, these plants are mainly consumers of energy. And it is estimated that the municipal uh, water waste sector in Europe consumes uh, the equivalent um, to the annual production of uh, more than two large power plants. And uh, yet, organic uh, matter in its wastewater equates um, to a chemical energy potential of 87,500 gigawatt hours per year, or the output of 12 large power stations and the municipal wastewater treatment plants can be transformed from net power consumers into energy neutral or even energy positive service providers. A lot of those um, uh, plants are financed by EU funds. So a great opportunity to use this money to solve an environmental problem and take the energy transition forward. And in this respect, I'm happy to conclude with um, seeing the energy efficiency and the renewables policies as a uh, no regret options also in relation um, to the water energy nexus. So uh, thank you and I wish you an excellent discussion today. Back to you, Pernilla. Thank you so much, uh, dear neighbor. I'm also in Brussels, uh, <laughs> but not in the commission, of course, I'm in the European Parliament. Um, no doubt that um, you know the song from uh, the big oceans uh, on uh, the potential uh, of the water. So that's very, very nice to hear. And also we respect fully that you don't have time uh, more to today. Uh, and I look forward together with my colleagues uh, to continue our conversation on also the many other uh, nexuses uh, that can enrich uh, our understanding and the catalyzing of the potential uh, from relating water into uh, especially the uh, energy uh, efficiency and energy consumption profile of the union. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, stay healthy and happy. Bye. So, dear friends, uh, what a, a, a talk to, uh, to start with. Uh, now we dig into the, uh, the more... Um, deep waters uh, of uh, 
knowledge of science, of technologies, and also good advices on how not to uh, let the water potential to the uh, energy uh, profile of the union um, drown and die in a kind of uh, Bermuda triangle between politics, uh, technology, and uh, business opportunities. And that's why we have uh, this uh, great panel of speakers to help us to find uh, the grit beneath the, uh, the, uh, the uh, potential Bermuda Triangle and to help uh, us uh, as policymakers, but also in conversations with the uh, research environments and, and the business, uh, the world of businesses, uh, both uh, small scale uh, innovative first movers uh, amongst the SMEs and also the vet giants of, of uh, the uh, European uh, uh, water uh, supply uh, industries uh, to find out what to do the next couple of years, not only in the revisions of uh, the EED and the energy performance of the buildings directive, but also the it could be the uh, zero pollution action plan. That's also a part of the uh, of the upcoming uh, initiatives to be uh, dealt with. So. Uh, it has been a little difficult to uh, to decide we, we, who of the three gentlemen uh, that should start, but we have chosen to uh, invite you, you and uh, Mac Adam, to be the first. Uh, uh, I know you are a professor of uh, membrane science, uh, and also that you a couple of years ago had a very big award on your um, um, membrane toilet. That is not what you are going to tell us about today, although I would like to he hear more on that one, but you will tell us uh, about uh, energy uh, production in a holistical approach. And you will also address the urban wastewater uh, directive uh, for us. And that kind of sets the scene uh, for the conversation. So thank you so much for your participation and, uh, not, and, uh, and the, over to you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so so energy neutrality is um, has been the existing framework through which we've looked at infrastructure investments over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and it offers a, a, a variety of benefits. So improved customer value, lowering cost to treatment, improving sustainability. And that last factor is particularly important if we think about the fact that globally, at a national level, we use between two and 5% of grid produced electricity for the treatment of water and wastewater collectively. But actually, as we move forwards into this period, we've started to use a new lens to look at energy neutrality, which is through net zero or decarbonisation. And if we look at that and refocus our perspective, actually it really matters as to which infrastructure investments we should choose going forwards, because there are different alignments and different agendas associated with fulfilling that remit. And, and that means that we have to sort of break down the investment decisions into three categories. So the first is energy reduction of existing infrastructure. The second is emissions reduction. Uh, and the third is increasing renewable energy production. And it's through these three lenses that we can then facilitate, yes, energy neutrality, but actually a drive towards net zero. So if we look at that in a little more detail, energy reduction of existing infrastructure has been going on for the last 10 to 15 years. And there's been some really successful investments, particularly around some of the major considerations such as aeration for wastewater treatment, which, constitu which constitutes around 50% of energy requirements for wastewater. But there is increasing regulatory requirements for water quality. And with that comes increasing, increasing intensity of those individual processes, but also the requirement for new infrastructure, new processes that add, provide added value to the treatment of uh, and the production of better water quality. With emissions reduction, we've been really focused in for using a, an energy neutrality lens, really focused in on offsetting grid produced electricity, which has a direct carbon benefit, but actually now, increasingly, whether using a shadow price of carbon or using carbon accounting policies, water authorities are increasingly looking at uh, ways in which they can capture fugitive emissions. So what kind of abatement procedures, what kind of investments actually reduce down uh, fugitive emissions? So things like nitrous oxide, not just carbon dioxide, not just methane, but actually these gases which have higher potency 
but also higher lifetimes. And so are more complex in terms of being able to achieve that net zero ambition at a European scale. We, we heard a little earlier as well around uh, energy production. And so renewables have always been core to the water business. Uh, and actually PV and wind are exceptionally mature and increasingly we see uh, an increased onus and focus on being able to use those sorts of facilities to offset some of the operations. But intrinsically, we have increasing resources. We have hydropower, biogas, hydrogen, all of these opportunities present uh, new and, um, and significant areas of exploration, not just for the water sector, but actually thinking more holistically around global and national infrastructure. So in this context, we've got to think more around water energy, energy integration. And so three examples. So the first is biogas to biomethane. That's been a process that was facilitated directly through the Renewable Energy Directive at EU level and has seen massive in infrastructure investment and has led to huge amounts of offset of renewable heat. Renewable heat is the most difficult energy source to decarbonize. And actually the water industry plays a significant role that could grow to between five and 18% of offset of, renew of, of, uh, of natural gas consumption, which is a massive contribution. The second contribution is in green hydrogen. So green hydrogen also seen as a major opportunity to decarbonize heat, but also to decarbonize uh, electricity. But in the UK alone, this means increasing water production capacity by 933 megalitres per day. So whilst we're also trying to reduce down that energy requirement inside our, inside our, our gates, we're going to have to increase the infrastructure and increase the energy requirements in order to deliver water at sufficient quality to generate renewable hydrogen in order to decarbonise heat and decarbonise transport. So huge infrastructure investments, but also huge opportunities. So these factors are, are multifaceted in terms of their challenges, but also their opportunities. And actually, if we think more collectively and we think more around an integrated approach to other sectors, there are both financial, economic and sustainability criteria, which can really offer genuine value both to the business and also to the consumer. And, and so that's that's sort of where I, I'm at, really. So so what I'm trying to, I guess, I guess, sort of come to come to the conclusion of is around reframing energy neutrality around net zero. So generate new challenges and, and actually sort of present um, real opportunities to look at wastewater differently, but also look at the infrastructure and how we can integrate better at, at a European level and a national level, too. Wow. Just to the point, I didn't say uh, that it was uh, five minutes, but you you nailed it and uh, continue to be a role model also in that uh, respect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor McAdam. Now I will turn my eyes to you, Jonas, uh, talking from uh, Copenhagen, um, being a Dane myself, but we will not talk more on that in this afternoon in respect uh, to the fact that you represent one of uh, the world's very, very big, um, both entrepreneurs, uh, but also uh, role models in water reuse. Uh, and you will um, tell us uh, about your solutions and also your uh, suggestions uh, on how to uh, reach the uh, climate neutrality in uh, 2050, uh, 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 2030. Uh, but also uh, you will tell us a little bit about the uh, climate uh, partnerships where Denmark actually uh, has a role model uh, um, amongst the European countries, uh, but also in the framework of the newly agreed EU climate law, where we know that now the commission uh, uh, must take initiative to start up and also to facilitate uh, uh, sector specific uh, climate partnerships. And what could be better uh, if we also this afternoon could maybe uh, grow some seeds uh, in the environment of stakeholders and businesses uh, uh, in, um, in, the, in the union that we can actually start uh, the first EU climate partnership, uh, especially uh, focused on, on water. I think it's needed. Uh, and I know that you have ideas on how to kickstart that. Jonas, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Penelia, and thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to sit in this wonderful panel and just speaking after the, the commission, that, that is really an honor. So, so I think this is, this is a very good occasion to come up with some good suggestions on how to move the water agenda forward in Europe. Um, just reflecting a little bit on the topic itself, uh, energy and water is hugely interlinked. Um, you use a hell of a lot of water when you produce energy and you use a hell of a lot of energy when you uh, produce water and when you treat uh, wastewater. So I think this is just really an, an, a nice issue and it's a really nice uh, discussion that we have today and it's really uh, clever what, what even just said that we need to see it as a, under the umbrella of the of the whole climate agenda and the zero pollution action plan and the and the and the European Green Deal. So I think that's that's the right start. Just zooming a little bit out on 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 the global context and, and, and the global context of where we are with the water sector politically, we need to achieve the SDG six by 2030. To do that, we we need to treat three times more wastewater than we treat today. And if we should do that, we need to use a lot of more energy and we will have a lot of more uh, um, CO2 emissions coming from that. So last year, I think, or was it two years ago, the International Energy Agency, they calculated two on two approaches to reach the SDG six on this specific issue, issue with the water treatment. And, and the difference between these two approaches is just remarkable. If you take the approach where you do business as usual and just benchmark from the from the situation we have today uh, and and take it up against the benchmark of the best available techniques that we have and that and we see uh, not only in Denmark but but we have a good example from Aarhus Water and, and Aarhus uh, Municipality um, then you have 650 tetrawatts that's the same as the whole uh, coal-fired um, um, power plants in Europe. So, so it's it's really a big issue, and you can re and there is really something to do here politically, and we need to choose the right track. S uh, zooming in on Denmark, because I'm a Dane and I'm following that uh, discussion here in Denmark pretty much. Um, we have we have the a very ambitious uh, overall target on on climate uh, mitigation. The government wants to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 70% in 2030. To, to reach that, they established 13 um, what they call climate partnerships, where they invited all uh, sectors to come up with their own roadmaps and plans to how they could actually deliver on this issue. And the water sector came up with a very, very ambitious target, saying that they will be in the energy and climate neutral by 2030. And uh, I think this is, uh, to my knowledge, the first target uh, of its kind um, in the world. So that's really something that that is, uh, of course, I'm, I'm 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 happy that it's happening in Denmark. But I think we should try to see how we could bring this further on to Europe as well, and see how we can use the good experiences from Denmark. Just last week, we got the progress, the first, um, the first. Uh, what do you say calculations on how it actually going in Denmark at the moment and and they they actually project that we will reach this um, uh, this target before 2030 and they actually want and we, and we will actually become net positive so we will actually see the possibility of having a, a so-called sink uh, in in the Danish water sector so I think we should really try to tap into the ideas from the Danish water sector and 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 see how we can use this as a platform to uh, for the negotiations of of the of the coming uh, urban wastewater treatment directive uh, next year when the commission come up with their plan because this is there is there is a lot of good things that you can just directly apply. Finally, I would like to touch a little bit upon the industry because I think it's heavily uh, uh, lost in the narrative uh, when we when we talk about water policy in Europe. When you look at, at, at the zero pollution action plan that came out last week, there was nothing mentioned about the industry uh, and the water and water reuse in the industry. And that's a really uh, huge lost opportunity. 50% of all the water in Europe, that is all the abstracted water in Europe comes or are used in the industry. 
Um, and there is no legal incentives at all in the European acquis to reduce this, uh, this water consumption or to be more efficient in the water sector. And that's, uh, we need to do something about that. Uh, Grundfos is a uh, part of uh, Water Europe and, uh, and in, in Water Europe, we have suggested a specific target on, on, uh, on water reuse. We, we, I think we have the positions where we say that we should in 2040, we should, we should reuse 75% of our industrial waters. That is technically possible and it's also economically viable when you look at the, on, on the time, timeline. It, it, it is possible, and I think that's that's something we really should try to go for. Um, thank you, Penelope. Thank you so much, uh, also Jonas, also for being uh, precise on time. Uh, that gives us a good uh, time frame for the Q and A's uh, after the next and last uh, panel speaker, who's uh, Alexis de Kerchove. I don't know. I all right. I know that I didn't pronounce that uh, as it should, but I know uh, that uh, your company uh, is uh, Silem, uh, and that is how it should be pronounced. I didn't do it correct in the beginning. I look very much forward to hear what you have to tell us uh, because I know you will touch on uh, governance and uh, why we uh, need the water sector to be a part of uh, the go-to for energy neutrality. Alexis, the floor is yours. And you need to unmute yourself. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introductions and, and uh, apologies for the tongue twist, both with my name <laughs> and the company. But um, great, great exercise. Um, yeah, and I, I really thank you for, for this opportunity to, to speak today. Uh, it is a great panel and following Kadri, uh, uh, Iwan uh, and, and Jonas, uh, I, I follow on the footprint and, and resonate with the messages there. Um, with the latest uh, climate law that we uh, that was uh, lately uh, agreed upon, uh, Jonas reminded that we have a, an important challenge um, by 2030. And uh, to address that challenge, especially in those critical days today where scientific models have uh, already expect that the 1.5 degree Celsius increase on earth might be reached before 2025, it is critical for um, the, uh, for addressing greenhouse gases emissions in a holistic way, cross-cutting all sectors of the economy uh, with the same priority. Um, and we, we, we want to make sure that um, we address this as it was reflected in the previous discussions. Uh, and we truly believe that there is an opportunity there. Um, we believe that carbon neutrality presents fundamental opportunity to shape the future of the water sector. Um, to grab this opportunity, um, the next really big challenge we want to address uh, within this audience is, of course, through the revisions of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. Um, it is a great opportunity for us. When we look at the water and wastewater sector, we know it is extremely energy intensive. Um, we know it takes up to 3.5% of the European electricity consumptions. And also at the municipal level, it represents 30 to 40% of its total energy or electricity bill. Um, there is a lot to do there um, and to address. We, are, we know that um, there is always uh, a choose between enhancing pollution control in one hand and the reductions of greenhouse gases on the other hand. There is a lot of debate on that level. We talk about micropollutants, we talk about uh, addressing water scarcity with more energy intensive technologies such as reverse osmosis. However, modern technologies are there today to um, address both at the same time. It is important to address um, the way we handling water resources, such as avoiding um, the uh, water losses in distribution networks, such as the drinking water directive is implementing. Um, and when we talk about reducing energy or use and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we have discussed about several ways. We discussed about changing the perceptions that wastewater is a waste and shifting it to uh, 
the wastewater as a resource, recovering energy through heat, uh, kinetics, hydraulics, and uh, uh, carbon sources. And where I would like to focus now a little bit more is on the potential of gaining energy uh, from better efficiencies in the processes, both on the collections and treatment of water. The water sector, as we know, especially in utilities, is a public model, and it has been suffering from massive underfunding uh, over the last century. Uh, what it leads us to um, is also the fact that it's based on a procurement model that um, favors investments based on price-based selections of innovations and not necessarily account for a full life cycle of those technologies to truly address its performance. These two factors leads to um, the fact that all investments made have been, of course, rightfully prioritized in keeping stable, safe water quality, but has created massive inefficiencies in an aging infrastructure across all Europe. We know the water losses in the infrastructure. We know um, the challenges that we have in uh, the treating more complex pollutants. At Xylem, we believe that the digitalization of the water sector is an important step forward to um, the most effectively enabling a huge gain of energy uh, across the, uh, the water sector, the water infrastructure, and in, you know, in then reducing its environmental footprint and carbon emissions. I'd like to give an example. Um, I'm mindful of time, I reached my, my limit here, but in that quick example, I'd like to highlight the fact that in one plant, for example, in Germany, of about half a million uh, thousand P equivalent, uh, the installations or the implementations of a digital twin based on machine learning, which is basically mostly software installations, has enabled a reduction of uh, energy use by 26%. That is equivalent to about um, 500 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. If we translate that optimization to the populations of Germany, we will reach up to 100,000 tons of CO2 saved. And if we translate this at the European level, it means about half a million tons of CO2 equivalent saved only by implementations and managing better our uh, infrastructure with, um, with digital solutions. So today, I'd like to enhance the point that we are the uh, we are in control. We, we can be in control of the impact. We have all the tools available. And what is critical now is to make sure that the drivers ahead of us are set up in a way that helps the promotion of those technologies um, for win-win situations, both in the management of our water resources and an optimal uh, energy use or optimal um, energy efficiency in those processes. I tried to stay as much as time as possible, but thank you very much, for Pernilla. I will stop here and I look forward to the question here. Thank you so much, Alexis. And yes, the questions is actually our uh, common chance to be able to give the floor back to uh, all three of you uh, to elaborate uh, even more on what you have uh, uh, said and to unfold the potentials in a way that we, in uh, a little hour, says uh, goodbye to each other with a handful of good ideas of, of what to do uh, to catalyze the potential of the energy efficiency from the water. Now, I have already a couple of questions uh, coming in from uh, the audience. Thank you so much, but uh, let the, the flow continue. I would like, uh, because uh, Alexis, you had one good example uh, to, to the, the um, conclusions that you made in, in your uh, speech. I would like to go back to you, Jonas, uh, because you have mentioned also the potential from the water reuse in the industry. Um, I would like to know uh, if you can uh, highlight one or two uh, examples uh, of the potential. Uh, is it birds on the roof or is there actually some role models for others to, to play around with and uh, also to, to copy? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Penelope. And uh, of course, I would like to come up with some ideas or some cases or something that could inspire. But first of all, I would also like to just say a little bit on, on, on what processes in when we are talking water, water reuse, what is it actually we are aiming at? Because it's, of course, the processes and, and the industries where you see the most water use. 
that is most interesting as a start at least. And it's, it's processes where you, where you see cooling, where you see painting, and where you see, see, see cleaning. These three issues, if you could start with them, you will really, you will really come a long way. And, 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 and I think we should try to look into a, a legislation that actually starts there uh, at a European level. When it comes to cases, of course, it, this shouldn't be a Danish, uh, <laughs> Danish uh, chit-chat story about all the good things in Denmark. But, but there is a brewery in Denmark that is doing something very good. Carlsberg, for example, they just, they just um, built a new plant where they reuse 90% of their water. And and um, and that's really something that is the state of the art as I see it. So 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 that's at least they, they come forward. They they show the latest technologies uh, and 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 of course Grundfos we has also been a part of it and helping them in in, the, in that idea. So we have we have knowledge about how to build up these 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 plants. Um, and 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 with this strategy, Carlsberg which Carlsberg would, would actually um, reduce their energy consumption with ten percent. Uh, so so there is also some gains there. So it's not you. You don't only you don't only save the water, um, and you you also save energy, and that's very good for Carlsberg because they they can now produce beer with very very little um, water use. So they can move productions all over the world, uh, also in very water scarce areas. So that's that's really a win for them that they have moved in that direction, and that didn't start it out with a business case. It started out with a with a vision and an and an ambition. And, 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 and that's, that's really inspirational. Um, so of course, I think the, the most ambitious will go first, but we need to have, to have everybody on board uh, on the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. And um, let me excuse myself for being a proud Dane, also knowing that it's not only uh, Danes who drink Carlsberg, I mean, oh, and not even only Europeans who does. Um, so uh, before I take the next question, I would like to just <clears throat> go back to, uh, to you, Professor McAdam. Do you have a comment to the two examples uh, put forward uh, by uh, Jonas and uh, Alexis uh, before we take the first uh, question uh, here from the audience, uh, which is a specific uh, question from the Netherlands? Uh, yeah, so I think I think the, the question of uh, water reuse and its impact. Um, I, th I think there's multiple ways to look at it, and actually, you've got to look more holistically at the investment cycle. What we have to bear in mind is that even direct postable reuse now is happening, uh, and so mm -hmm. there is best practice going on both at DPR and indirect postable reuse. Mm -hmm. So what it also means is that we're not necessarily reliant on the same technologies. There are, there's an ability to be able to build multi-barrier approaches that don't have to rely on traditional techniques. And so we can do it with lower energy. And actually, if we think more wisely around where and how we implement this sort of technology in a more holistic level, at a, at using thinking more at national infrastructure rather than at local infrastructure levels, we can think differently about how to reduce costs, how to reduce carbon, and how to build best benefit. Hmm. An example of that in a, in a very, very crude way is that as we approach water scarcity, there's increasing need to build storage for water, for example, increasing reservoirs, increasing that sort of storage and also offset risk. But the flip side of this is that if we start to build water reuse plants, the same sort of investments give us the same sort of results. And actually one offsets the other in terms of its capital and risk investment infrastructure. So, mm -hmm. so there, are, there are multiple ways in which you can actually play uh, to get the same answer from uh, very, very different investments uh, that offer very different risk levels uh, and different mm. rewards as well. Well, that's a good point also in terms of the uh, um, very valuable principle of, uh, of technology neutrality, but also uh, cost efficiency that uh, in the union, we must uh, continue to have this framework of being co-creative and competitiveness because it actually makes it possible for us to, to do better every time. Um, so now to the specific question, which actually relates to your comment, uh, uh, Professor Mag Mag Adam. Uh, it's from Vincent Delat, uh, who says, uh, who asks in the Netherlands, so we have concluded that uh, we are short of fresh water. So we need to switch on other sources of water reuse, as mentioned, which has a higher carbon footprint. 
is this taken into account in the required investment plans for decarbonization? So now into the money question. And I think uh, all of you three clever men, persons, you know how to address this uh, very important question. So Alexis, would you like to start? Yes, no problem. So uh, that really to the questions from Vincent, is that correct on the chat? Yes, 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 yes. It is, it is a very good question. And we know that when we talk about, um, let's say, starting utilizing water from uh, seawater or brackish, uh, we, we, as I mentioned during the discussions, it start taking more energy intensive um, solutions. Um, and, and there, the, 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 uh, the optimizations, I mean, creating the, the, the water to address water scarcity is a must. There is no questions. There is no sacrifice on the end product that can be done here. However, it is critical to think in the investments in how it can be done in the most efficient way, um, um, which means looking at the full life cycle of the equipments when the investment is done um, to, to make sure that none, first of all, the, uh, the equipment and the process are uh, comprehensive on a full 20, 40 years of life cycle. And that uh, downstream, the utilizations of that water is done in, uh, in the most, uh, uh, let's say, efficient way in the distributions. Uh, look at uh, how much drinking water is currently being lost in aging infrastructures due to, in the distribution network, it's about 20%, which immediately uh, raise the questions like why even producing more fresh water when we actually uh, release it afterwards. So I'm not, I don't want to generalize um, for for the percentage on on wasted uh, drinking water, but um, let's be mindful of of the whole cycle and not just one point in the productions um, of uh, of uh, in in terms of energy efficiency. Hmm. Thank you. Good points, uh, Jonas. Would you like to continue? Yes, uh, first, first of all, I, I agree with everything that Alex just said. I think it's, 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 it's really important uh, learning that he is telling us. And I think, uh, of course, non-revenue water is, is a big issue. But, but just to, to reverse it a little bit, I would say it's, we need to value water in another way that we do today. Even in Europe, we are not valuing water in, in the way that where, where we, we implement good water practices. So, so, so it's it's really important that we that we try. I know that the European Union is not having the capacity to actually to tell the member states what they should uh, charge for water, but 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 anyway, they could try to to do something anyway uh, a little bit harder than they do. There is there is actually notions in the in the water framework directive that you that you should set up a price and a tariff system that is actually implementing a full calorie cost. Uh, um, practice in the countries, and that is not done at all. So, if we do that, you could actually come come to a much better uh, understanding on all these issues that we are talking about today. Uh, so, so that that would be my first line to say, uh, adding on to what Alexis just said. Thank you. Mm, also, uh, a, a good a good part of the equation, um, also in terms of the ETS discussion. So, what incentives works the best would, must be. The logic, um, Ewan McAdam. Uh, so, so underlining the question is the fact that we need to increase capacity, uh, and so that means more infrastructure, and, and and it's effectively unavoidable unless we take approaches that Alexis already outlined around trying to reduce leakage. So, looking at existing best practice, we're still not there yet. So, there's still a lot more opportunity in terms of dealing with existing in infrastructure to offset future change. Uh, the, the second factor is that actually investment decisions can be quite fragmented uh, and so influenced by local policy. And actually, again, embedded inside that question is around carbon footprint. But what is carbon uh, and what kind of carbon do we want to save? And so most of the focus, very little focus is on bedded carbon. Most of it is based on direct carbon emissions, which is associated with power, which is essentially what's inside that question. But actually, increasingly, we have to also consider fugitive emissions. So what are the fugitive emissions that we need to try to reduce and dissipate as an industry? And how significant are they relative to the attributable costs of increased infrastructure? And actually, if we look at things like nitrous oxide, 
which is a massive problem for the industry. So 17.5% of greenhouse gases from wastewater treatment, nitrous oxide, it's a major problem. We can change that actually through changing our existing infrastructure approaches. And so it's not just about the response to water scarcity that's driving the conversation around carbon. We need to have a more open conversation around actually how do we value carbon and actually what is carbon and what is carbon risk? Because the second factor is it's not just about CO2 equivalency, it's also about CO2 lifetime. Nitrous oxide, 100 times around in, uh, in the atmosphere. Methane has a relatively short residence time. And so actually we need to be more focused and targeted on, on in terms of how to decarbonize the industry. Well, that's also a very good point. Maybe we should give uh, CO2 some love shower uh, <laughs> and work from there also to have energy to, uh, to what is also very uh, much uh, important. Now, a new question from uh, Dieter Staat, uh, also back to the money uh, question. He asks, in some member states, the water operators already invested a lot in energy efficiency measures. Since the low hanging fruits uh, are already harvested, achieving EU wide additional EU reduction or EE reductions, it must have been targets uh, could coincide, uh, coincide uh, with the disproportional costs. How to, and that's a very, very good question, how to not punish the energy efficiency front runners? Um, Jonas, you are the first one to nod your head. I guess also uh, the two other gentlemen, Alexis and uh, McGeehan, uh, and uh, even uh, you have um, uh, some points on that. But Jonas, go ahead. We will not punish the first it's, movers. How to no, avoid uh, that? That's a really tricky question. Um, yes, it is. It's a good and one. It's, uh, and it's, uh, it's a question that we, have, we always discussed internally in Grundfos, how, how we should actually, uh, how should we actually cope with this? But I think, I think we need to be larger than that. That's a, at least what, what, what we tell ourselves, that we need to, we need to go first and then uh, do what's right and do what's uh, within, our, within our purpose, uh, the different industries among each other. So I think that's that's the first thing. I think you should do it no matter what. Of course, there will be a question of of, of who will actually benefit most from this. Uh, but I think, uh, in general, I think we should uh, we should we should see it as a as a as something that that everybody needs to do. And I don't think we we, we can just. Uh, it's a very good question, and it's it's really difficult to say that. That we punish. I don't think we see. I will. I will see it as a punishment. I will see it as a big achievement. And 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 um, and I cannot come with a very good answer to 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 how we can actually overcome what somebody would see as a punishment. That's that's probably what I would like to say there because it's 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 of course right. And if your first move is you will you will lose some pace over time. Yeah, maybe it's about the sector specific baselines that we need to be a little careful about. We had that on the MRV on, in shipping where there are front runners among nations uh, and others are not. So how to, to, uh, to be fair uh, um, to, because also we need in, in the EU to have uh, front runners both uh, on, on member states level, but also in the industries. So. Alexis, you are the second one to nod your head to this very delicate and tricky question. So please continue. What are your good advices on how not to punish, but actually to, to use the energy and the role models of the first, uh, uh, first movers? I, I, I think it's a great question indeed. Mm -hmm. And when we look at um, targeting uh, both um, greenhouse gas emissions and energy efficiency, um, and especially energy efficiency, it comes with dual benefits. Um, it comes with dual benefits because first it uh, address uh, the environmental footprint, but it also improves um, the, uh, the local operating cost of uh, the municipalities and allows them to be uh, more resilient in, in their operations over time. So the way we see that it can be set up is not by penalizing those that are the, uh, the um, early adopters of, of technologies or ambitions, but to support them in the best way to progress in that path 
uh, towards towards a target that actually makes sense for Europe uh, in terms of like being carbon neutral or energy neutral at the plant uh, by addressing other means. So the the stepping stone uh, on which we need to draw the baseline, as you you mentioned, Pernilla, is critical. Uh, having a net factor that allow them to quantify where they are and how much they need to do more to to um, to get to an overall target. And others that are followers will, will just have to start investing more from the beginning. Thank you. I, Pernilla, oh. there we, I see you. You were frozen. Yeah, first. yeah, that was a, a, a pause in the connection. Uh, Ewan, uh, do you have some points to put forward yeah. here? Yeah, so I think I think I think part of that comment actually relies on the fact that the, the implication is uh, that we've made improvements to energy efficiency of existing infrastructure, and so how do we avoid penalisation? Well, we avoid that through innovation, uh, and so it's, innovation has has two offers, if you like. The first is uh, one of trying to get a, a national or international response, and we do that by by garnering incentivization, for example, that can help allow for an infrastructure change. An example of that is, is where do we perceive value coming from for water utilities? So we can produce, from a cubic meter of biogas, we can produce 2.4 kilowatt hours of power, or we can produce six kilowatt hours of heat uh, if we choose to export that into the grid. Those are two massively differential opportunities in terms of providing renewables from the water industry. But, and, and, and actually can come with very, very attractive financial returns to offset that infrastructure investment. Uh, and so, but, but that does rely on having, um, having decision makers that can allow for uh, those sorts of opportunities to be realized. The second is, how do we see innovations that can have opportunities internally to drive change? And so an example of that is technology that I work on which where we selectively extract ammonia out of wastewater and convert it directly to hydrogen. And so we do that using waste heat that's available on site. We have plenty of waste heat at the right quality. And so we can turn a problem into a financial opportunity that is also a carbon, a carbon free opportunity. And so we're driving change through the business by offering change to infrastructure that has very, very short paybacks and multiple opportunities for financial reward. And, the, and, and fundamentally, this is obviously just one example of innovation being embedded inside the business, but there are those opportunities. And so we also be able, have to understand how to capitalize the advantage of those carbon changes. Okay, thank you so much. Now we go back to technology and leave the money uh, aside for a, a moment. Uh, it's a question from uh, Sarah Johansson to you, especially, uh, Alexis. Um, could you give some examples uh, on how energy can be recovered from wastewater through kinetics? Uh, you mentioned heat kinetics and carbon, uh, if she was not mistaken. How large could that recovery be uh, in comparison with, um, e.g., uh, biogas production, potentially? And let me also announce that uh, if there is one more question from the audience, we can take that on board. And then we will go to the final question, which will be also for you three guys to wrap up uh, and tell us the, from each one of you the two most specific uh, important measures uh, to take in order to fulfill the potential of EE in the water sector. Now you know in advance. But back to the specific question uh, to you, Alexis, uh, on uh, how energy can be recovered, recovered from, uh, from wastewater. I, I am happy to, to uh, connect with Sarah uh, offline, obviously. Um, the, the recovery of, of energy through uh, hydraulic kinetics is in many cases, or in several cases, where uh, a wastewater treatment plant brings up wastewater to a certain level for treatment, the treatments then um, rely on gravity through the plants 
for its operations. And before heading to uh, an environmental discharge of the treated wastewater, there is an opportunity to recover some of that um, uh, some of that energy that has been put into lifting up the water uh, to a point at the plant level and um, produce energy uh, to help making the plants more uh, energy neutral. Um, I, I I'm located in Stockholm. Um, at Stockholm, uh, the, the, the wastewater treatment plant is lifted up on a, a platform or on a rock before releasing the treated wastewater in the Baltic Sea. Um, there is uh, hydraulic turbines that recover the energy um, in the fall of the water into uh, the sea. That energy recovered in the fall of allows to help uh, uh, that, uh, that plants to be more uh, energy neutral. Um, it is in addition to the heat recovery, wastewater uh, is constantly between 13 to 15 degrees Celsius all year round there is an opportunity to recover that energy, uh, that heat energy. Uh, and those two kinetics and heat are in addition to the biogas productions from uh, organic carbons that uh, is, is available in wastewater. So multiple sources, uh, as we discussed through this discussion to uh, make the plant more energy neutral uh, and carbon uh, neutral. Thank you so much. I don't know if uh, Alex and uh, Ewan has a comment to, to that specific question. Otherwise, I have uh, the last question from the audience here by me. Should I, I we take that? Some, so I can yeah. quickly add something on that. So, so heat, heat has two different duties. Uh, one is quality and one is quantity. So heat quality is quite low in a wastewater treatment works, whether that's waste heat or, or uh, indirect heat uh, sources that Alexis just mentioned but the heat quantity is significant. And so the challenge is always around trying to understand the exploitability of that, of that product at the end of this. We've done a lot of heat audits internally in large scale sites. And so through existing infrastructure, we actually have modest heat quality and high heat, heat opportunity actually, that's never been realized. And so this is megawatt hours of available heat that we have on site now that's being wasted. And we actually have to dissipate that heat in order to get the processes to work. And so it's not just about looking for new opportunities. There are existing opportunities within our infrastructure base that would allow us these, these rich opportunities with near term with near term innovations that could really have massive advantage to, to carbon and energy efficiency um, uh, for, for large scale infrastructure. Perfect, thank you. Um, now we take the, uh, the second last uh, question. This is from uh, Denis Bonvillain, uh, saying that there is a, uh, a certainly a potential for improving energy efficiency of water assets across Europe, but we need to consider, uh, he says, to uh, the, the size of certain utilities that can uh, be very small in spe specifically Austria and Finland. And therefore, with less available investment capacities, he asks or suggests, um, shall we start by targeting the big utilities and, and plants for drinking water and wastewater treatment? It could be above uh, 10,000 or 20,000 uh, inhabitants, uh, for example. So this here is about the, the scale of the business, uh, if I understand the question correct. Um, who of you, Jonas, again, you are not in your heads. Thank you very much for this. Uh, this is also a very tricky question, and it's something that we discuss all the time. Where should the cap be? Who is, who is too small to actually be regulated at the European level? I think, I think it's, uh, we should strive uh, through a regulation uh, towards a legislation that is regulating everybody. Uh, but maybe uh, in, in some, in, uh, face it in, in, in so, it's, so the small can come on board accordingly. Uh, I, would, I would say that, that we have an opportunity right now, with Denis is, is talking about the um, investments. We have a situation right now with the recovery facility after COVID-19 there, where there should be really some, some good opportunities right now to actually see huge investment in the wastewater sector, but also in the drinking water uh, sector, especially now where we have a new drinking water directive. And focusing on, on on water leakage as well, so 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 there is huge opportunities. But I think we should strive to include all, 
because uh, w water is water, <laughs> and 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 uh, I think it, it, no matter who uses it, it's very valuable, and 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 we should consider it as a variable this valuable resource that should be protected uh, in the best way. So so that's that would be my opinion. It's a good idea, Jonas, because that the, the other part will be a part of, of uh, the political fight, uh, by all means. So don't don't start with the solution or the compromise. <laughs> In a way, okay, Alex. Alex, oh, Alexis, sorry. No worry. Um, I, I think it's a it's a great question, and uh, I I believe that as we as we move on, the uh, the latest taxonomy on finance towards sustainable solution is a critical element to consider for all public private and uh, public private investments and uh, and financing. Um, the more we, we, we allow those uh, that taxonomy to be implemented across um, the organizations, uh, the more we'll be able to see emergence towards innovations that will help uh, implementing uh, uh, solutions for, for, for meeting the targets. So um, not much more to add here uh, besides that let's all get a clear understanding of, of uh, this taxonomy and how more uh, better leveraging it across uh, the, the different stakeholders of the water sector. Mm. Wise points. Uh, Ewan? Uh, so so I'll, I'll make a few points. Uh, so, so the first is around connections. Uh, and so if we look at uh, actually uh, small scale wastewater treatment works, well, actually they're not, they're, they're, they're fragmented infrastructure, but actually they're still reliant on large scale infrastructure. So quite often you'll have sludge exports coming from those small works to centralized wastewater treatment works. And so, so there are these connections actually between large scale infrastructure and smaller scale infrastructure. So that's the first point. So if we innovate at a larger scale, it still has implications for that smaller scale. The second thing to take a step back from is that small scale still offers you a new opportunity. At smaller scale, you have more land availability per capita. That means you can have extensive treatment rather than intensive treatment. So robustness without the risk, lower carbon opportunities actually, through, through thinking th uh, through not identical solutions at all scales, but rather thinking more around how do we develop innovation that, that allows us to, to facilitate the same levels of treatment through um, low, low risk, uh, low maintenance infrastructure that offers low carbon benefit uh, at that smaller scale. And there is an awful lot of work being done on trying to improve decentralized treatment so that we can have it essentially as a fit and forget solution. But the, the third part is around um, innovation and segmentation. And so we also have to look at innovations that are modular and scalable. And there's the ability to scale down and there's the ability to scale up. And so if, you, if I give you an example, the environment sector is a massively on, entrepreneurial and agile market. Uh, and so if we look at anaerobic digesters that have been put in for single farm, um, farm scale um, processing. Lots of those businesses now actually work as collectives, consortia, even, even tankering gas from one facility to another facility so that they can get economies of scale on, on individual unit operations. And so there's an awful lot to explore here around trying to think more collectively in terms of how to build economies of scale, but also how to generate the best carbon benefit and the best energy benefit uh, overall. Perfect, perfect. Um, I don't see more new questions coming up in the chat. Maybe it's because I'm narrow-winded, so please excuse me. We will continue in the chat after in the uh, threads uh, afterwards. Now to the conclusive question to you, uh, dear panel. Um, if one of you uh, can say the two most important measures uh, to take in order to fulfill the potential of the energy efficiency of the water sector, and you cannot reiterate what uh, the person before you uh, or before him said, because I want us to conclude with six measures to go, uh, to go forward with uh, from this afternoon. And I want to use the principle that the last speaker in the first round is the first speaker in the last round. 
So Alexis, uh, this will also be your uh, conclusions and maybe thank you to the audience for applauding uh, your uh, contributions uh, this afternoon. Your two most important measures. Thank you. Thank you, Pernilla. First of all, for the amazing work you did here in moderating this, this panel, but also to keep us on our toes and challenging us um, in, in this exercise. So I appreciate this. Um, I, I will say that for us, the, the two main message that we would like to push forward is first, the fact that technologies exist today. Um, I highlighted several examples, including digital enablement of existing processes within collections, treatment, distributions of water and wastewater. And it is critical to uh, address those. Technology doesn't mean necessarily heavy investment. That means doing the right thing, uh, considering the full scope. Um, digital enablement is not necessarily a CapEx intensive investment. Uh, it looks at a, an overall operation. The second message is towards our policymakers. Um, it is important that we address um, energy efficiency um, and carbon neutrality within the coming uh, revisions that allows, uh, will allow all our water uh, sector to truly take a step forward in leading the path across all industries to do the right thing for resource management. Um, we, we have ahead of us uh, the opportunity to change the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive. Um, we are looking at the forthcoming Fit for 50, 55 legislations package. Um, we also have uh, the Industrial Emission Directives, the Energy Efficiency Directives. All those tools are critical platforms for um, addressing uh, the problems that we have been discussing today with tangible solutions. Thank you very much for uh, again, this great opportunity here. Thank you. Likewise, um, I mean, good questions are of course valued, but uh, if you hear great answers, uh, it intrigues. So thank you back, uh, Alexis. Now, Jonas, the man in the middle, uh, not the raisin in the hot dog end, as we say in Denmark. Uh, your additional two uh, most important uh, measures to our handful plus one. I'll use the uh, opportunity to, uh, of course, also echo uh, Alexis what he said. It's, it's a brilliant event and it's uh, very well moderated and it's interesting to be a part of. But but if I should, uh, of course, Alex, he, he, he stole all the good uh, legislative... Uh, <laughs> that was a trial course. Yes, so, we so heard he, that. He took it all. But, but anyway, I, I will try to, uh, to, to... The one that concerning me the most is the lack of water in the Zero Pollution Action Plan. And it, it came out last week. And, mm. and um, I, I've learned that the council won't even produce council conclusions. This is a little bit technical about what's going on in Brussels, but they will not even pick it up as council conclusions because they have a lack of time. And uh, I learned that the parliament uh, neither wants to take it up because it's, uh, they already have that declaration. So, so uh, I really think there is a need for a strong political push on water reuse uh, in the industry um, because it's now, it's not in five years. It's, it, now we have the opportunity, it's now the whole dossier and the ACI is revised. So that it's extremely important with action right now and it's political action. So it's it's something about setting some clear targets, aspirational targets for where we should where should we should be. We have we have we said seventy five percent. It's it's something that we have calculated based on the technical potential. It could be somewhere else, but we need it to move. That's that's number one. The second one is is uh, we haven't touched very much upon it today, but but it's very important that we implement the drinking water directive right. It's. We have we have we have um, a big opportunity now where you see the recovery facility uh, could actually uh, be, be used as a lever for implementing non-revenue water uh, practices in the member states. 
and that's really a big opportunity that should be used now. So, so that's that's the second one. Thank you so much, Jonas. Um, you and McAdam. It's always tough to follow, isn't it? Being the third. Yes, it is. Um, but you are the professor, so you know <laughs> what to do. So, so yeah. Well, first, first of all, yeah. So, th thanks for all the questions, and I really, really enjoyed the panel. I think, I think also, the, I think the, having a breadth of opinion and, and coming from different positions, I think, offers uh, a lot of value, and I think you get to see the the the, the extent of the conversation uh, mirrors the width of the problem, mm. well, and also the opportunity actually, and that there's so many different ways you can tackle this challenge. Um, uh, and so, in in terms of what what I'd sort of recommend, I guess. The first is um, uh, more and more when I look at this, um, I, th I think from a regulatory point of view and from a policy makers perception, uh, I think there's, there's a need in order to foster a demand driven market. I think we've got all of these opportunities to deliver new products, new energy products, new opportunities, but actually the market isn't there. The market demand is struggling. And so when we talk about resource recovery, anything else, without having the market in place and the market developed, we have all the ability to be able to deliver infrastructure. If we wanted to deliver infrastructure for hydrogen tomorrow, we can. You know, there, 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 are, there are ways to facilitate that, but there's no market. Uh, and without having that market there, then actually we're, we're standing still. And so there's a massive barrier to us, which, which we have no control over. And that, that really requires work on, on all levels. The, the second is um, in, in actually rethinking net zero. Net zero is an opportunity for us to rethink infrastructure investments more, more, more holistically uh, and, and rebalancing both the way in which we go about treating water, but actually thinking about how we value water itself and, and, and what's contained inside water. And, and, and through that, I think it's really important not to neglect how significant a role investment in innovation is and, and I think actually more often than not, if we look across all other sectors, so for example, um, the telecom sector historically has a really great um, uh, legacy of investment of a certain percentage of profit into innovation. And, and then as a result of that, the market is innovating at a very, very high rate and, and we're behind that curve. And so having opportunities to in innovate a major infrastructure level, so, so nationally, but also locally at a unit process level, is massively important. And I think there's a way to strategize that, but, but we also need to be able to um, uh, accelerate it as well in order to be able to meet these sort of uh, real, really uh, lofty ambitions, uh, if you like, in terms of being able to deliver to net zero by 2030. Wow. What uh, important uh, six measures, and I know that if I asked for 10, I would also get the, the four missing uh, from you, uh, dear panel. It was great to, uh, to help us all through, both listening, but also uh, to, to, to ask questions to you. Uh, it is very much appreciated. Also, the energy coming from uh, all uh, the... Uh, the participants from uh, from the audience, thank you so much. I guess, and now I'm trying to get eye, eye contact with the Dirk. I guess we should take on board that this afternoon taught us uh, that um, maybe water is uh, still not running as a flood into all EU legislation, but the ideas and the potential is huge. So um, I guess we should organize more afternoons like this one here, addressing uh, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, um, the big series of revision of existing directives, but also the new in initiatives that hopefully uh, will come from the commission side in the upcoming years. I mean, we know that the energy efficiency directive will be announced very soon. We could make a specific on that. We also have the energy uh, performance of the building stock. We have uh, next quarter, uh, we have the, um, the urban wastewater directive who last week turned 30 years old without any revision until uh, next year, next uh, winter. So uh, I think we should use this opportunity that now we know that there is a lot of interest 
uh, in energy and water and water quality. And also uh, to do what actually uh, you and so wisely said, let's, uh, let's value the, the, the values uh, of water. And also, I, and that's uh, something that's also very important to take on board that the technology is there, as you said, Alexis, uh, the solutions are already there, but the, 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 the market design is missing. So also we should address uh, uh, what balances uh, innovation, research and development with technology together with finance and how the, uh, the inner market of, uh, of the water sector could be redesigned uh, to contribute with the uh, potential uh, of uh, how to be uh, net uh, zero on, on, on CO2, but also to harvest all the other benefits of really valuing uh, uh, and creating innovation uh, through water. I hope that covers all, and I hope I didn't promise too much uh, from us uh, in the MED Water Group. I, I hope I didn't. Uh, I can see, I now I would like to see Dirk uh, nod his head. Um, uh, I look forward for us to announce uh, our next and upcoming uh, events uh, in this circle here, and also to see all of you returning uh, so that we can build from ripples uh, over a flood to a tsunami of how mm. to redesign the legal uh, framework mm. in all its details in the union on, on water and energy and environmental quality. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. Thank you uh, very much, Kuni. I think your uh, concluding words, words were very good. And I think um, you're absolutely right that the full value of water is still not sufficiently recognized, but at the same time, I think uh, we should be very positive because together with many other water uh, mem membership based water related umbrella organizations, we've been having meetings with 16 different European commissioners over the last year. Uh, like we did actually five years ago. And the positive sign has been that where five years ago, still we often have to explain to the different commissioners and the cabinets why water was so important. This time we did not have to do, to, to do that explanation anymore. So I think that's a very, very positive sign. Yeah, And uh, also I think with the European Green Deal and the digital transition to a, a green Europe and a digital Europe, I think the signs are very positive and it's up to us as those actors who want to really defend the importance of water in this debate, uh, that we really put our shoulders below this and we really put it, push it forward like we did in the session today. Yeah. And in that sense, I would also like to thank you for your leadership over the, the last over the last year in bringing the importance of water, I would say, to uh, the political audience, specifically with the background of the European Parliament. I think uh, this has been very important. We've had now uh, over the last six months, three sessions of the MEP Water Group, each time on, I think, very important topics. And I, as you already mentioned, I'm looking forward to our upcoming meeting with the governance board of the MEP Water Group in June to decide on uh, the agenda for the, the upcoming six months. So thank you very much also from my side. Thank you all. Stay happy and healthy and let's continue our work together. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.